Just a short time. Uh, more engineering will be celebrating 60 years in the city uh, next year, so that is a, a neat deal. I want to make mention that uh, Onstead Twitchell has also been part of this, and Chris McShane will be moderating the next two sessions. I stepped in to assist Chris. He is actually in the Twin Cities uh, with his father, who had some surgery. So prayers and well wishes go out to, to Chris and family. The, the function and the format of today is there are some 3x5 uh, cards with pins on the uh, inside uh, rows and if you have some questions uh, we'd ask in the next few minutes you generate those and pass them up towards us. I will attempt to prioritize and look to the mayor for some assistance um, with that and then while we're doing that we're going to have the, the panelists, the legislators introduce themselves, um, maybe a little bit of history on how long you've served, what committees, and so forth. And then once the questions, uh, uh, we get into those, uh, the question will be posed if it is to a specific legislator, that will obviously be obvious. If it isn't, we'll let you guys decide who you want to have take the first stab. Uh, that will be uh, three minutes uh, for that first response, and then 90 seconds each for the next two responses, and then those that are left, about a minute or so, uh, of response and, and Mark will have a, a, a sign of some uh, note that says 30 seconds or oops, we're, time is up. So we'll, we'll play by those rules and then at the end of that we'll have a wrap up and that'll be about an hour for the folks of, uh, in the audience, those questions and then some thank yous and then we'll be on our way for a Saturday if that sounds about right. So if maybe we can start with you Representative Beetle <coughs> with some introductions. There, now we have some power on here. Uh, so thank you very much, Rich, uh, Bernie, uh, Mark, and everyone else who helped set this thing up. Uh, we always appreciate these opportunities. I know over in the Fargo side, we don't have any of them scheduled yet, so I appreciate West Fargo uh, getting a jump on us and making sure that we're, we're good to go. Uh, my name is Thomas Beadle. I serve in the North Dakota State House uh, have since I was first elected in 2010, so I'm going into my fifth legislative session out in Bismarck. I live in District 27, which is southwest portion of the city of Fargo and the far south portion. We have West Acres Mall uh, and Davies High School, all in my district. 
Um, so I don't have the, the city of West Fargo proper, but I do have quite a bit of West Fargo school district. Myself, uh, my wife and I live over by Bethany on 42nd. Uh, we're zoned for Cheyenne, for example. So, so we have quite a bit of West Fargo uh, public schools in our area. Um, this is my first session now serving on the Appropriations Committee. Prior to this, I have four sessions on uh, political subdivisions and three on industry, business, and labor, and one on judiciary. Uh, so this has been kind of a whole new session for me because now uh, we're, we're experiencing where the money and everything else happens. I mean, that's, that's kind of a total, we have two sessions going on kind of at once. One is policy, one is appropriations. And uh, so I'm excited to hear what's going on in the policy world over here because uh, I've been in the dungeons just uh, crunching numbers the whole time. So. Uh, look forward to any conversations, questions you might have. Uh, certainly uh, enjoy. Uh, we actually have a pretty good attendance here today, too, so I appreciate everyone coming out here on Saturday and, and spending their time with us. Thank you. Uh, hello, everybody. I'm Representative Ben Koppelman. Um, I serve District 16, which is most of West Fargo that's south of the interstate, as well as um, the areas east of, of 9th Street, north of the interstate, and also uh, the Meadow Ridge area up uh, closer to Main Avenue and 45th Street. Uh, I was first selected in 2012, so this is my fourth session. Uh, I s currently serve on the Finance and Tax Committee as well as the Government and Veterans Affairs Committee. Um, I have uh, enjoyed the uh, switch to finance and tax. There's been a lot of interesting uh, processes, and we certainly try to, uh, um, in that committee, try to make sure that uh, we give back to you, the citizens, uh, as much as we can, whenever we can. And uh, we also have to deal with a lot of uh, unique requests from uh, committees that, uh, that uh, or from areas that might have unique concerns. So we look forward to uh, hearing your questions. Thank you. So my name is uh, Dave Clemens, um, a senator from District 16. Um, for those of you that are maybe a little unfamiliar with the district, 16 is basically from Main Avenue down to 40th Avenue South, and then it jogs back and forth some, but it... Uh, goes over west to 9th Street, Veterans Boulevard, and then over to 42nd and 45th Street in uh, Fargo. Uh, I was elected in 2016, so this is my second session. Um, it makes it a lot easier the second time around. Uh, maybe I shouldn't say easier, but at least you're more familiar with the, the process and how things are working. Um, I serve on the uh, Human Services Committee. Uh, Senator Judy Lee is the um, uh, chairman of that uh, committee. That's my chair. I'm sorry, David. I'm trying to bring the chair up, and I just fell into the floor. Okay. We'll give you time here. Usually a more competent <laughs> As I said, Senator Lee is the chairman in Human Services Committee. This is the first mistake I've ever seen her make. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah, Human Services Committee is a very intense committee, and uh, I'm sure you'll hear more from Senator Lee. But, you know, one of the comments that's made in that committee, we deal from the, the womb to the tomb. <laughs> it might sound humorous, but it really isn't. Uh, there's so many problems throughout life, and that's the things that we deal with, uh, behavioral health, child care, long-term care. Okay, thank you. We're doing introductions, Senator Lee. Thank you. I apologize for being late. That's not that I slept in. I had a pre-planned car appointment and found that my furnace in my garage was not working last night. I won't bother you with the details, but I was trying to get everybody where they were supposed to be to get this stuff fixed today, so thank you for your tolerance of my, uh, my mess that morning. But anyway, I'm very glad to be here. The, uh, these forums, I think, are important, and I'm happy to uh, respond to questions as you, might, uh, as you might have them as we go along. <coughs> Senator Clemens has said he and I are together on the Human Services Committee. <coughs> I also serve on the Political Subdivisions Committee, and I really enjoy that also because that's really grassroots. It's townships, cities, counties, and we see some of our city officials uh, there. Uh, Mr. Mayor was out this past week talking about some things that are going on that we need to be more aware of also in Bismarck. But I wanted to just give you an example of some of the stuff we do. And the reason is because I'm losing patience with the local newspaper which bashes 
the lazy, corrupt legislators uh, pretty regularly because so many people there are working so hard. This is one bill. This is a rewrite of the county social services programs as it relates to uh, the relationship between the state and the counties. It's 111 pages, and I have 31 amendments, and my project for the rest of the weekend is to write a floor speech that will help other people understand what the bill is so we can vote on it with some kind of informed way. And Senator Clemens, of course, is a part of this committee as well. I want you to know that a lot of people work really hard. I have a wonderful human services committee this year. There's always been a good crowd that's been there, but it's, it is really an exceptional group this time, don't you think? Yeah. We've got um, experienced people as well as uh, a rookie that is really sharp. So I look forward to your questions. Thank you. Uh, hello there. I'm uh, Representative Kim Koppelman. I represent District 13, as does Senator Lee, same district, and uh, it, that is really the heart of West Fargo. It is uh, everything in West Fargo, north of Interstate 94, north and east of Interstate 94, as it curves around us, uh, with the exception of a slice on the east edge and the southeast edge, just north of the interstate, which is uh, the part of District 13 that, or, excuse me, District 16 that the other Representative Koppelman explained. And then uh, we don't have the area north of 12th Avenue North, and there's a little slice on the northeast side of the city also, uh, south of 12th Avenue and north of uh, Main Avenue, which is part of another district. But So it really is the, the central part of West Fargo. Many years ago, uh, when we came into the legislature, District 13 included all of West Fargo and some of the rural area around it. But as our population has increased, our geography has had to decrease. And so we welcome, uh, and years ago it was three of us up here at, at these kinds of forums uh, because that was the representation the community had. So it's good to see that our school district and our community is represented by so many more folks, and uh, we appreciate that. As I was listening uh, to the others, I thought about uh, representing District 13, and I believe this is my 13th legislative session also, so been around there for a while, um, have enjoyed it greatly. I chair the uh, Judiciary Committee. I also serve on the Political Subdivisions Committee. You've heard a little bit about what that is. Uh, the one that Senator Lee serves on, obviously, is in the Senate. The one I serve on is in the House, so some of the same bills go back and forth. Um, love to tell you more about what's happening in the Judiciary Committee. Time doesn't allow that now, but maybe we'll have an opportunity later. But suffice it to say, I think we probably have a record number of bills or close to it in the legislature this session. And uh, work has been busy, and uh, that's how we like it. Uh, from the time our feet hit the floor in the morning till the time our head hits the pillow at night, we're going. So uh, it's good to be here with you today, and I look forward to your questions. <coughs> My name is Brandi Pyle. I represent District 22, which is a little bit of Fargo, West Fargo, and mainly the rural areas of western Cass County. Um, so we have a uh, vast um, footprint in our county. Um, I serve on the Education Committee. This is my second session. Um, I thoroughly enjoy the education. Um, the K-12, a little bit of higher ed is kind of what we see a little bit in there. And then I am the Vice Chairman for the Political Subdivisions uh, Committee in the House. Yeah. No, I, I know how to run the gavel. Um, oh, yeah. Yeah, we've we've had a record number. We finished up all of our bills yesterday in political subs, so we have about 20 bills to move on uh, next week, and the goal is to get it done next Thursday, just sit in committee until, until the work gets done. And Representative Koppelman is right. We work um, from the time you wake up and you're in the shower thinking about the different bills and preparing your floor speeches to the time you go to bed. It's it's a 24-hour operation, even on the way here, I'm answering text messages. And um, my kids get a little... Did you pull over to do that? Yeah, uh, well, I, I did have a driver. I, no, I, I have a driver. <laughs> I do not do that. Yes, no, no. Driver yeah. that. yes yeah, my, my husband's here with me today, so um, I do not answer text messages while driving unless it's uh, the voice thing connected to my to my car. So um, it is a, a, a challenge being a mother in the legislature and having four kids at home um, and one in college, so I, I have five right now um, with our exchange students. So that's always a challenge, coming home and making sure everybody is... Um, has their clothes ready for the week um, and, and staying engaged in their daily uh, activities. So I just appreciate you having here, having us here. Thank you.
My name is Representative Tom Cady, and I represent District 45, which is both North Fargo uh, all the way up to uh, Argusville, and then I also represent uh, the north side of West Fargo, so I get to the north end of both. Uh, this session is my third session. I'm on finance and taxes session and transportation. Both are uh, very exciting committees. I enjoy both of them, finance and tax. We get to deal with all sorts of different issues and uh, different what to do with taxes and, and uh, different things that go with that, so that's very exciting. I was, uh, let's see, so... Yeah, so first elected 2014, been on a couple different committees, and uh, this session has been very busy. We've had a ton of bills, so it's it's been uh, busy for all of us and long days. Well, thank you all for those introductions. Uh, Representative Katie, I believe you're a civil engineer, is that correct? That is. Good man, good man, absolutely. <laughs> um, we're going to start yeah. off, and again, reminder to the, the group, if there's any other questions of funnel them up this way and we will get them into the, the queue. So I'm going to start with more of a general question and again I'll leave it up to the group to decide who will answer it first, but it's please provide some overall context for the status of the state budget, including current revenue forecast and potential <coughs> amount of increase, what your thoughts are, potential for overall increase in the total expenditures, and maybe a general statement about priorities. In 25 words or less? Uh, I'll give you a little bit more. Thomas is the appropriation guy. Sure. Uh, as everyone knows, last legislative session was a tough one uh, from a budgetary perspective. You know, we had uh, oil prices plummet from where they were the previous biennium. Coming into that session, we had to do some five percent budget allotments. We had to see some significant reductions. Uh, ag prices have continued to be low. <coughs> and they were during the last biennium as well. This session, it's all bounced back a little bit. Ag prices are still suppressed. We, we're all aware of how, you know, the impact of uh, what's going on federally is impacting our local commodity prices um, and on the international level too. But where we do benefit is, is seeing a bounce back in oil as well as an increase in production. Last session, we only uh, estimated there to be about 900,000 barrels per day being produced in North Dakota. Um, right now we're a little over 1.3 million barrels per day. So even though the price stayed relatively low, production increased and that brought additional revenue. For some context, about half of our budget right now comes off of oil revenue. Whether it's funding into the legacy fund, which now we can tap the interest for the first time, um, or it's funding into the, the strategic investment improvement fund, um, which is basically a second little mini general fund for us now with how it's being used. Um, that gives us the opportunity to make some pretty significant investments. That being said, with oil prices still hovering a little below 50, the legislature adopted a, a lower revenue forecast than what the executive budget and, uh, that's put, put up by the governor was built on. Um, we anticipated oil to be at about 42.50 a barrel, as opposed to the governor being about 46.50, $47 a barrel. Um, that alone is a reduction of about four or five hundred million dollars worth of revenue coming into the state. Now we recognize, uh, looking right now, what North Dakota's price is that we're receiving is about $50 a barrel for it was average for the month of January. So we know that we're getting a little more revenue than we had anticipated before. And that's gonna help us as we build the budget. Right now, you'll see us pass out a lot of budgets here in the next couple of weeks out of the Appropriations Committee, especially on the House side. Uh, we are making some investments back into some of the agencies. We're, we're Every uh, state employee didn't receive a, way, uh, a pay increase during the last biennium. Um, right now, the House's position is we're giving every employee a 2% uh, annual pay raise over the course of the next biennium. Um, we're, we're making a couple of strategic investments in projects, highways, et cetera. Um, but it's going to look like it's staying pretty, pretty low for the time being. We have another revenue forecast coming out in March. I expect, based off of how commodity prices are, are acting, that that revenue forecast will be up again. And so we will add some more money back into it. But we're always about a billion dollars underwater at halftime. And crossovers in two weeks, and that's our halftime. We're always about a billion dollars underwater. Right now, we're trying to make it so we're as close to, to neutral as possible. And then uh, we'll see where it is in March as we can go forward. Okay. And then again, as the the process uh, suggested two follow-up comments, about 90 seconds or so. Charlie? 
I think it's important, as uh, Representative Beadle has noted, that we're, we're early on in this process. I'm more of a hockey analogy person, so I'd say we're approaching the end of the first period. As co the conference committee time is an important one as well. But what is also important to think about is, I, I've already had a couple of uh, comments or calls or messages this week about why do you put leave all the uh, really important stuff till the end. You know, obviously it's not important because education and human services are at the end. And I think all of my colleagues here would probably agree that the reason we do that is to see how much money we've, we're going to have and how much of it we can find from other places that we can put into those very important budgets. So it isn't because they're not important, it's because they are important. But they are left to the end so we can see how, as we go through this whole process, how are we going to make sure some of those most fundamental things that we really <coughs> want and need to do can be covered in the best possible way. So it's, it, it, we are just moving our way through. I think it's very important we look at the kind of priorities we have in Cass County. And uh, I think there are people here who may pre appreciate that thought as well. The diversion is a big deal and we've got to see what we might be able to do there. And those bills will also be among those that we might be considering most carefully. <coughs> Thank you. Okay, and also, this is on or not? I can, can't tell. Okay, good. Uh, I also wanted to uh, just chime in. I spent four years in the Appropriations Committee uh, several years ago, kind of in the middle of my legislative experience, so I, I uh, know exactly what Representative Beadle is going through, and I, I'm familiar with the dungeon he spends all weekend <laughs> and, uh, and cranks out numbers, and it's a, kind of a thankless job, but it's a very important job. A couple of things to just note. Uh, he mentioned the uh, the plan right now for increases in, in state employee pay and, and state employees all across the state really do a great job and they work for us and we want to take care of them and make sure that they're they're well compensated uh, and but we also realize it's the taxpayers money we're using so there's a balance there as well but uh, what I'm hearing from the other appropriations folks from the chairman and so on is that the plan is to continue to fully fund their health insurance and they have a family health insurance plan. So think about the value of that in today's market with the cost of insurance. Uh, that's a huge benefit that uh, not even many businesses offer anymore. Sometimes they'll offer a partial payment or a payment for uh, uh, the employee only but not the family, that kind of thing. And that's a great benefit that our state employees uh, receive. Also, Representative Beadle talked and Representative Lee, or Senator Lee rather also talked about the economic forecasts. And that is important and that is why we delay until the end of the session to really know where we are because we have some great financial experts from companies that come in and track all of these things. We're a commodity state. We depend on energy. We depend on agriculture. And it's very important to kind of uh, track that to know what we expect our state revenues to be over the next biennium. But the last thing I just want to leave with you is how responsible our appropriators are. Uh, they take great care in making sure that uh, we're responsible about how we spend money. Uh, and that's why sometimes you'll see the legislative forecast was here and the amount we collected in fill in the blank, sales tax, oil tax, whatever it is, is here. That's great. That's where we want it. We'd hate to have it the other way around where we have a, a shortfall. And that hasn't happened, I don't think, since the 1980s. Um, finally, the uh, other thing I just want to mention is we have great reserves. And uh, before chairing the Judiciary Committee years ago, I chaired a committee called the Constitutional Revision Committee. We formulated something you're probably all familiar with called the Legacy Fund, which the people of North Dakota voted on. That is nearly $6 billion now that's there for uh, your future and your kids' future, and that's important. Thank you. Senator Clements? Yeah, I'm not going to get into numbers because you have to be an appropriations to even understand a lot of that. But for the benefit of the people that are here, uh, it can be a lot of kind of confusing when you're hearing reports coming out of Bismarck because we work with these different committees and we understand some of that, but for the average citizen, uh, some of this stuff probably doesn't really make sense. But the one thing I wanted to mention uh, for the benefit of those here, when you hear on the news, one and one, two and two, three and three, it might be two and three, when they're talking about increases for these different, um, like state employees, human services, things like that, what they're meaning is, by that is maybe it's going to be a 1% increase the first year, maybe a 2% the second year, or it might be 3% increase the first year and 2% the next year. So just to kind of <coughs> clarify that a little bit for you to help understand what they're talking about when they're talking these two and two numbers. Any others? 
can right? just add that for anybody who wants to, to look, the Office of Management and Budget uh, website on the state website has all of this financial information available. So it's available to any of you. We also do, our, do make it available. If you go to legis.nd.gov, uh, we do have the current session uh, budget information on there, and we, we keep that updated. So anytime the Appropriations Committee takes an action on a bill, um, then that's found on our 2019 budget information link on there. So even before it's, it's fully adopted and acted in law, you can see uh, a snapshot of where the Appropriations Committees are, are currently at for the budgeting process. Um, and I think it's updated about 24 hours after we make that action. So those, the OMB site and the legislative site are two very good resources. Okay. Thank you very much. I'm going to move on to um, what is called the uh, prairie dog bill, if you will, and uh, wondering if you support that. And if so, why? If not, why not? And uh, again, we'll let uh, it's a general, uh, not specifically directed to anyone. Jump in. All um, right. Thank you. The, what, what's called the Prairie Dog Bill, and I think uh, Senator Rich Wardner, the Senate Majority Leader, came up with that term. I don't see a lot of prairie dogs in my backyard, but uh, industrial. <laughs> build great infrastructure. That's he was. He had. Uh, he had great fun poked at him by a uh, Teddy Roosevelt impersonator about uh, the bill being named after a rodent, but that's another story. But at any rate, it has to do with uh, funding for for local governments, and you may be familiar that in recent years, the uh, North Dakota legislature has sort of jackpotted money to a lot of the uh, a lot of the areas in the western part of the state that have had a significant impact from the oil industry uh, for infrastructure and a lot of things that were needed out there. And uh, some of us in this part of the state were happy to support that, but also realize that we have needs too. And the oil revenue is not just for the places where the oil comes from, just like sales tax revenue that might come largely out of our Cass County area. It helps benefit the entire state as well. So this this uh, proposal really tends to spread those dollars across the state and help political subdivisions in our part of the state. And I think it's an important effort. Okay. Thank you, Representative Katie. So I think with the Prairie Dog Bill, I think there are some good things with it, and there are some bad things with it. I think some of the good things include a more consistent spending formula for the locals. I think some of the <laughs> negatives with the bill include the fact that it is $250 million of, of new spending, and I think we need to do that very carefully. You know, in my opinion, what I'd like to see with this with this bill is some property tax relief. I think, you know, whether we cap it or change the formula a little bit, I think we need to look at property tax relief as we look at this because right now the the counties get about three point four billion from or the locals I should say, uh three point four billion out of the budget ultimately and this is another two hundred and fifty million. Property tax is the number one issue I hear about and I think it would behoove us to address property tax within this bill. I don't think we should just pass two hundred and fifty million in new spending without addressing that issue. Lee? I would respectfully uh uh, disagree with the recent speaker because we're not looking at adding a tax in order to do this. This is a different distribution of funding that is coming into the state. And I, I'm not going to pull up the bill. You don't sure. know all of those details at this point, and I'd have to recall the number. Which is 1266? 10, 1066? Okay. Anyway, the point is that I, I'm absolutely opposed to caps, and there are people who are living, who are, who are sitting in this room who are involved with city and county government and schools. And if I have a problem with the tax structure for the schools, I should be talking to the school board members. We elected them. We should be talking to the county commission or the city commission, but before we complain about that, we ought to go to a meeting and find out what's going on. We ought to find out what the budget really covers and see whether or not we want to give up public safety, police protection, snow removal, for heaven's sake, uh, all of those kinds of things. It's up to our local political subdivisions to make those decisions on behalf of the people here. So we have to, uh, we have to recognize that there is a role for those local <coughs> political subdivisions, and it is, uh, it is an appropriate time for infrastructure in this part of the state to be addressed. 
one comment that I'll make on it too. We haven't had the hearing on it done on appropriations. I believe finance and tax just recently kicked it out. Um, one of the things that the, the Prairie Dog Bill does, for those that don't know, you know, when we collect oil tax, we set it into all these different buckets. What this does is adds a few more buckets and shifts the order of them um, for what's in the Strategic Investment Improvement Fund and provides kind of a, a dedicated amount. So uh, here's a $100 million block. That goes to counties. A $100 million block. That goes to, to cities. Um, 400 million goes back into the SIF fund and then airports, et cetera, all down the line end up receiving a, a chunk of money. And then it gets broken out from those buckets and expended out to the individual political subdivisions. As the bill was initially proposed, and I haven't seen the amendments that the Finance and Tax Committee did put onto it, so I do know they changed it. Um, originally there was set aside, uh, you know, from the cities and, and counties budget, uh, our buckets, we were looking at about 25 million coming out to like Fargo and Cass County area as dedicated funding coming from the state. What this does is it helps provide a little more surety for the communities, what they're going to be receiving from state money. We are already giving them a lot of the, this money or, or a good chunk of it, but right now it's making it so it's a more predictable model. We're putting it into a formula. They can understand what to expect, what uh, that they can do, and then they can build their budgets off of that accordingly. So rather than ha them having to rely on property taxes for most political subdivisions or sales tax for those that are home rule charter subdivisions, uh, they are able to get a little more state dedicated money so they don't have to levy that back onto the consumers and the people at the local level. Thank you. Representative Copperman. Thank you. Um, and uh, he referred to the uh, Finance and Tax Committee, had just seen it. Um, although we had a tremendously long hearing on the on the bill, um, we did not spend a tremendous amount of time working on the bill. Um, there was only one amendment that was adopted. It was, adopt uh, it was brought forth by the chairman of the committee, and it shifted, I believe, $400 million dollars um, to uh, the SIF fund um, prior to the Prairie Dog funding buckets, if you will, being filled. Um, and, but otherwise, there just wasn't a lot of time to discuss it. I know there was a couple other amendment, uh, amendments that were briefly discussed, but I think the heavy lifting on uh, deciding if the makeup of the bill is correct is going to be done by the Appropriations Committee, at least on the House side. Okay. If I may, um, in the spirit of making sure I follow each of the questions as much as I can, there was a follow-up question for Representative Kading, and that was, can you please share your reasoning on the amendment that you, I, I suppose, authored or s offered up? Sure. So kind of what I offered up, I offered an amendment to essentially take out of the bill uh, half of the local distribution on the Prairie Dog Funds. And, and the reason for that is, back to what I said previously, is there's, we're doing nothing about property tax. And again, I think that's the number one issue people care about. And, you know, I I think it's, you know, it's good that we're sending money and we're, you know, working with it to reduce property taxes. But I think at the end of the day, we're not going to reduce property taxes by uh, sending this money to the locals. I think, you know, it's, it's new money and I don't think it's going to ultimately have an effect on property tax. And that's ultimately why I... I uh, introduce that amendment. Okay. Thank you very much. Any others? Representative Pyle. Thank you. Um, when I look at pieces of legislation, and I have not studied this one intently, I've been kind of stuck in my own committee at this point, um, but I always look at ways where the different um, governing bodies can look, work together between the state, cities, counties. Um, we all represent the same people. We are all citizens of these taxing entities. Um, so we all have to look for a better solution, and the more we can figure out and communicate between the, the, the different groups, I think the better the outcomes that we can, can do. Um, we've actually had some bills kind of attacking the, the, the budgets and how the political subdivisions put the budgets together, and it goes to school districts, park districts, cities, counties, and um, kind of backing up the time frame and, and adding in a, an election every year in a primary budget. <coughs> an election in the city of Castleton would be over $7,000 a year that we would be adding to the cost of that and, and put that into the context of the education system and their their calendar runs July 1 to June 30th. That is just, it'd make it nearly impossible um, for these entities to do what they do. And then you look on the other side with the small towns like Buffalo and Arthur, if they have a part-time auditor to put these more uh, restrictions on and how they operate, it is, 
it would be very difficult. So um, anyway, just my two cents. Okay. Thank you very much. Another question uh, along somewhat of the same lines is provide some background on your position of the multiple bills that are attempting to limit local political subdivisions access to levy authority. I already answered. I think it's a really crappy idea. That's a technical. Yeah. Okay. The other. Okay. I don't. I haven't seen the bills uh, specifically, but or, or, or many of them. But you know, I think the, the overarching issue, and, and Representative Kading has mentioned it, Senator Lee has mentioned it, uh, Representative Beadle has mentioned it. We have political subdivisions at the local level: cities, counties, school districts, townships, and so on. And then we have state government. And uh, as most of us find, I think, as we go door to door, knocking on doors to campaign for office. I think Representative Kading is right about this. The number one issue we hear about is property taxes. The state does not levy property taxes other than a very tiny amount, one mil for the uh, state medical school in Grand Forks at, at, the, at the University of North Dakota. Other than that, all of your property tax is a, lo a local tax. Cities levy it, counties levy it, school districts levy it, park boards levy it, etc. So now that's not that's not a blame game. That's just so people understand because I think most people that I talk to don't realize that they say, "Gee, my taxes are too high." Well, which tax? They say property tax. And so Senator Lee is right. That's the responsibility of our local elected officials. So many of them are in the room. People that are serve on our school board and city commission and so on. They have a lot to pay for. A lot of streets and and services and educating kids and so on. So obviously that takes money. What we've done in recent years is the state has jackpotted a lot more money to local government than we ever did before. We used to pay something, I think when I came in the legislature, something like maybe 35 or 40 percent of the cost of education from the state level. Now it's up to, what Mark, 80, 80 85 percent, something like that. So the state has been doing that consistently. In recent years, we've been doing more of that with regard to other programs, uh, things like human services that are now handled on the county level, but the state is helping to fund that. And uh, the Prairie Dog Bill is another example of that, taking money from oil, which is taxed at the state level, sending it to local political subdivisions so that they don't have to spend as much in your property tax dollars to pave new streets or whatever it is that they're doing. So that's the big picture look, and Representative Pyle is absolutely right. It takes a hand-in-glove approach. It takes a cooperative effort between local officials and state officials to work all of that out. Okay. I'm going to uh, switch around a little bit and go on to a different topic. We might come back to some, some taxation and, and levy authority in, in a little bit, but uh, I can ask uh, Representative Kim Koppelman on the uh, House Bill 1536, which uh, deals with setting tuition. And the question is, how exactly do you envision the Legislative Assembly setting tuition for all campuses in the university system? Well, I'm looking for the bill, but when you described it, I think I know which one it is. Um, it was a bill, actually, that, uh, that I introduced a, a few years ago as well, and it passed the House in that year. I think it was 2015, and it was defeated in the Senate. <coughs> Pardon me, please. The, uh, the question, I believe, was how do I envision the state doing that, and I would say look at history. Uh, the state set tuition for our universities and colleges in North Dakota uh, for most of our state's history. Uh, the state gave that authority away, uh, the state legislature did, in something several years ago called the Higher Education Roundtable. And uh, the idea there was that uh, the mantra at the time was that we were giving flexibility in return for accountability. I think there are many legislators would say we've given the flexibility and they're kind of still looking for some of the accountability. So the question comes, do you want your elected officials setting the rates at which your, your students, your children oftentimes have to pay tuition, or do you want that to happen at each institution or through the Board of Higher Education, none of whom are elected or responsible to you? And I just think it's something that taxpayers expect their elected officials to see. Now, when that happens, Obviously, it, it always was in the past, and I think would continue to be in the future, a cooperative effort. Each institution would come just as, as uh, you know, the, the street department comes to the city of West Fargo and says, here's how much we think we need to, to fix that broken street over there or pave this new one you're installing, and then the elected officials make the decision on that. It would work the same way and did work the same way, where the universities would come through the Board of Higher Ed or directly to the legislature and say, we think we need 
fill in the blank, a 2%, 4%, whatever it is, tuition increase for students in order to operate, and collaboratively working with them, just like we hear hearings on every bill we introduce or anyone else wants us to introduce during the session, they'd... Uh, you know, weigh those issues and make decisions. And that's the way it worked for most of our state's history. I think it's a better system. Okay. Representative McCaffrey. Uh, thank you. Um, to follow up on that, I think we also have to look at the legislature's responsibility to, to determine what the total cost of education is for, the high, for higher ed. And that um, Article 8, uh, Section 2 of the Constitution vests that authority in the, in the uh, legislative branch. And as a more of a general statement, I think the legislative branch has given away way too much of its authority, um, it, whether it be to the executive branch or to higher ed or, or other places, and I think um, that takes away the, the ability for those that are elected by the citizens to weigh in on what the citizens' wishes are or wills, and when we're trying to balance um, the spending across the board, we can't be putting in a X amount of dollars and then having individual institutions um, raise tuition significantly as well when we're trying to have affordable tuition for our students. So, thank you. On that too. Um, so, we do have the Board of Higher Education, which does uh, set to an extent the tuition and fees at the individual campus level. Uh, but it's important for us to keep in mind too that this is all derived based off of the higher education funding formula that was put in place. And we do have the authority, and we have exercised it since I've been in the assembly, where we've kept, we've frozen tuition for a year or two, and we've restricted it. And based on how the fun, and the formula gets funded, then that is you know we res can restrict what they're able to charge for tuition, what they're not, not to the individual dollar level, but to the overall pot of money that they need to operate and run the institution. So while we do, you know, have some level of control, we also want to make sure that, you know, the experts who are actually involved in the education process, uh, who are having the time and the resources to actually dive deep into what's happening on the individual campuses. We have 11 of them that we publicly fund across the, the state. It's not just NDSU and UND. Uh, we want to make sure that they have the, the time and the resources and the flexibility to adapt and adjust what they need to. Uh, to continue to operate those institutions uh, and make sure that they're providing a quality level of service at an affordable price for our students across the state. Shirley. I think it's all, <coughs> excuse me, also important to remember that it, that really is the third rail, or you want to say fourth rail, of uh, government in North Dakota because the Board of Higher Education and the higher ed system is really pretty independent. The, 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 control that we might have is obviously through budgeting in the legislative session. But that all started when our former mayor, Florence Bjornsson, was a student at NDSU and there was such control, such a brouhaha about some intrusion by the state government into what was happening on the campuses that there was public effort to change the law so that they are now a, a more autonomous organization. So we don't have total control over everything. I was on two energy panels last week for the people who are with the uh, coming on to the board of it or, or returning to the board of higher ed. I think another area that may deserve discussion, uh, if we have a moment later, is the uh, the proposal for changes in the higher ed board. But that there's more to this than us just telling them what they can spend. Okay. Let's touch upon the school system for a second and. Um, the general public likely does not understand, this is a comment, the challenges of our schools, what they face serving students with behavioral or mental health needs. Uh, what updates can you provide in your, your uh, view of that? Sarah Lee? We have had some tremendous planning that is going on in this and bills which will support changes there. And I think it's really important to know that we're not seeing uh, if we're not giving more money to each thing or each project or each issue that is required, but we have more people who are suffering from those issues, families that are in uh, difficult straits of one way or another, the impact of substance use disorders on parents and the way the kids are coming to school. Uh, last night I was talking to somebody who was a, a new teacher and how much she loves her work. But one little girl came to school yesterday and said that she, her family had moved into the shelter that day. In that school district, the school picks up the children from the shelters first and drops them off last so the other students on the buses don't know that those kids are in the shelter. 
We're trying to figure out, we've got great plans moving forward here in bills that are now under consideration, and so I'm optimistic we'll be able to uh, do good things to help the schools deliver the services needed so that the kids who have behavioral health needs can have those needs addressed and can learn at the level at which they're capable of learning, and at the same time not disrupting the classrooms or the traditional learning students who also really need to have a good education. Thank you. Senator Clement? Yeah, to go along with what Senator Lee is talking there, um, and being on the Human Services Committee, uh, we're, I guess, overwhelmed, you could say, with the, the issues that are out there in our community when it comes to behavioral health, um, the addiction things. And I really have sympathy for the K-12 through education system because they're having to basically be parents now to a lot of these children. And, um, you know, until parents uh, take the responsibility to start um, bringing their children in line with discipline and what's required of them, uh, this problem is not going to go away. And I don't think it's fair for the education system to uh, need to spend so much of their time. I mean, we're, we're trying to help this situation, but uh, for them to have to spend so much time uh, treating children and uh, addressing all this behavioral issue, and then the education actually suffers. And so um, we've been already discussing several things in human services where the schools are going to need help um, from human, human services to take care of some of these behavioral issues rather than leaving it on them and the teachers to try and correct this um, and the education suffer. Sure. Thank you. Um, one of the things that we have seen in the education committee, um, we've had bills to extend professional development days for teachers. Over in Pennsylvania, teachers get eight days of professional development. We get two for our teachers. And I, I really question if that's enough to um, adequately help them do what they need to do in those difficult situations in their classrooms. We did have a bill to extend a day. Um, unfortunately, it's about $2 million a day um, that it costs the state to um, host these um, gatherings to, to help the professionals. Um, that's always going to be the underlying issue, I think, is the money and where do we get it from and how do we do it to actually attack some of these behavioral issues. We had a four and a half hour uh, bill hearing for dyslexia, um, which is a, a learning disability that affects 20% of our population. And um, the results um, that are coming when kids are misdiagnosed or undiagnosed, the behavioral issues. Um, we had two moms testify that their fifth graders contemplated suicide because of how yucky they felt compared to their peers, how they evaluated themselves and that self-worth. And so when we see these things in human services, it's really coming. And like I always tell my kids and, and how I look at bills is, you know, let's work the equation backwards. We know we want happy, successful, um, graduating students who are going to do some really great things in life. So then what are, what are the inputs and what are the variables that we need to, to change? And what do we need to do in, personally in our home lives to make, you know, our, our students and our kids um, successful and then we need to, to take that and I always advocate for my, my kids in um, in school and I'm partners with their with their teacher and we have that, that conversation. If my kids kind of being a little naughty, then let me know, but like I'll be okay with it. So and I'll just make a comment too, piggybacking on the funding side. I know Senator Kyle Davison over in West, uh, the Fargo District 41, uh, he's got a proposal out there. I don't know where it's currently situated in the Senate, um, but it, it enables and helps the, the local school districts work together with regional educational cooperatives in order to find additional access to Medicaid dollars to help fund uh, a lot of the programs that they have going on. That helps bring some additional revenue in coming from the federal down uh, through the state to, to give the resources, the resources needed to the school districts to deal, especially with the, the behavioral health issue um, and the, the disability issues that a lot of our school districts, especially in Fargo and West Fargo, suffer. Because because we are a resource-rich district area, we have a lot of opportunities here. We do see people coming from the rural communities um, to access our resources and coming here. In, in particular, West Fargo Public Schools 
is tremendous success with students with autism. And so they have a disproportionate amount of autistic students going through West Fargo Public uh, because of the success they had. One other thing I'd touch on too with some of the, the issues going on with the school districts, um, this fall or winter before session, we had an opportunity to shadow one of the school resource officers in, in West Fargo Public School. Tremendous opportunity, that was a great thing. One of the things that I learned in following uh, Officer Baldwick at uh, West Fargo High School um, is one of the biggest issues that they have is dealing with drugs use in schools, the smoking, everything else. Uh, and e-cigarettes have become a very prevalent issue there. And one of the things that they repeatedly said is, you know, whatever you do, don't change how we're currently classifying it or, or loosen up our current restrictions on e-cigarettes because classifying this as a tobacco product, make sure we can keep it out of school. And right now we have, uh, as of this fall, they had, I think, 28 uh, suspensions already in West Fargo High School dealing with drugs in schools from the seniors that are buying it and giving it out to sophomores and freshmen, et cetera. So uh, we need to make sure that we're keeping some of those issues at the forefront because they trickle down to our schools as well. Thank you very much. Um, uh, just a personal note, uh, my wife is a para and actually got her start with Louise Dardis. Louise, thank you. My wife has been doing this now for eight years with special needs and uh, so she is every day serving our community. Um, so I'm going to ask a couple more questions on higher ed. Senator Lee, we're going to go back to that question on the state board. And then uh, to give you guys some uh, preparation, I think there will be a few questions on the diversion. Um, so the questions regarding the uh, higher education governance structure um, away from one board, um, interesting to, to get people's in input. So who would like to start with that? Jumping. Okay, okay Representative Pyle. Thank you. It came uh, came through our committee with a, an amendment for a two board policy. Um, from the conversations I've had with different uh, people, just there needs to have a change. Um, the two-year institutions really need to be looked at. Um, it was, you, you hear like kind of two different sides of the story and then you got to figure out what is the actual truth and what is kind of the story or the feeling and, and not the actual facts. Um, I do believe that uh, a two-board structure would help our two-year institutions um, to be looked at more closely and, and to give them the attention that they deserve and to address their needs, which is a, a different set of needs for a four-year in our, um, the NDSU and the UND, what are they? Research institutions, sorry, it's been a long week. So I'm, I'm in support, and so that, it did come out of our committee with a do not pass, 9-4, I actually have it up here, and there was four of us um, from the east side of the state that were in favor of it. Okay, thank you. Anyone else? <coughs> okay, Senator Clements. I don't have an extensive background on the higher education, but uh, along with Senator Lee, we did um, were in on the interview process with uh, a couple of candidates for the board, and um, you know the the governor has submitted a plan for for three boards. There was amendment for two. Um, and I guess I'm still uh, supporting a one board. And uh, there's been some comments, maybe we need more members on the one board. Um, and I've also um, heard from a person on the board that uh, maybe it's better to keep everything under one roof instead of there's already been some divisions and if we start splitting up into several other boards, I just have a feeling that... Uh, it's going to be even tougher to come to a uniform uh, university system. Early. Okay. It was interesting being on these <coughs> interview panels, excuse me, but I think realistically I don't expect that the public is going to vote for either a two board or a three board measure because there will be more people involved. I, ju I think, I just, I just don't see that being successful on the ballot. I'm, I'm not trying to be negative about it. <clears throat> I'm trying to be realistic about it. But it seems to me that we need to look back a bit and recall that 
We changed the board situation a few years ago so that instead of having seven year terms, there are now four term limits. And maybe that was a mistake, maybe it wasn't. But I think there would be, as Senator Clemens said, a better future for this whole system if they had a couple more people and they could have portfolios and they would have longer terms because the problem is that those that have some experience are really loaded right now with responsibilities. Uh, I, I was not crazy about the three board proposal because of the separation of the two research universities that are now collaborating on more than they ever have before. And my interest is not in having them be competitive in the academic life. So um, I'm, I'm happier with what the House had to come out uh, in, their, in their bill with the two. I, I would prefer, I guess, to see it also look at uh, expanding the current board and perhaps even looking back at that, at that term limit again, or the, the number of years in the term. Because, you know, we meet every other year, and if we did something wrong, then we could maybe come back and fix it. We'd like to do it right the first time, but sometimes there are unintended consequences. Thank you. And I'll just throw one final comment out there. So the, the Education Committee recently, you guys did amend it down to two, um, and you have kicked that out of committee, but I believe it was with the do not pass recommendation. Uh, one thing that we all, for the most part, I'd say that the, the majority of the assembly is, believes is that the current system isn't working, um, at least not as working as well as it should. We have board members that are stressed out. They don't have the time to deal with everything. You have a student member on there who doesn't have a long enough term to even get out to all the different 11 institutions that they're there um, as they try to rotate through. You have um, individuals who really only care about one or two of the institutions and are just kind of going through the motions with the other nine. Uh, it, it's not enough time or resources available for our board members to become experts with any of the campuses so they can't actually see what they need to do as an advisory board to advise those presidents in the administration. And as such, it puts more power in with the chancellor uh, who's running the system uh, in the back system than it does with the board members or anyone on the public face. And so I think that we all recognize that there needs to be some shifts, whether it's the two board or an expanded one board. We'll see how this all ends up going, but what we recognize is that our current system isn't doing do, uh, diligent enough service to our students. It's not servicing the state and, and allowing for the mission to, to be grown and fully fleshed out the way that they need to in order to meet all of our workforce demands that we have as a state, uh, in order to meet the research demands of our two primary institutions or, or anything else. We, we, it does need improvement, and I think the legislature is committed to at least doing something to help move the, the move the ball forward so we can continue to try to improve that system. Thank you very much. Uh, I am going to move on to the next question. We, Our time is moving along and I have to apologize in advance to some of the folks. Uh, we, we have a lot of questions and we're just not going to have enough time to get to them. Um, but I do think this is a pertinent one. Uh, this again rel related to the diversion. I'll, I'll read three things quickly. Um, as elected officials, please describe your individual efforts to advocate and secure support from your statewide House and Senate colleagues for the FM diversion. A comment made, my house would be underwater in a catastrophic flood. What are you doing to advocate for the diversion? And then Senate Bill 2238 uh, appears to be an effort to delay or stop the FM diversion. Will you support or oppose it? So those are the three diversion questions. Who would like to start? <coughs> Lee. I have long been a strong advocate and proponent of our flood control project here. I think it's critically important. Uh, I think about 1996-97 whenever I look out the window right now. And it, it's just, even though it may not be as wet snow as we might have had uh, at that time, but it's 21 years since that flood in which the community was within about two inches of losing all of Fargo. And it was because of Yeoman's work, particularly by our students in this community, that that was uh, averted. <clears throat> and in 2009, of course, we did it again. I don't really want to see if the city and county things that have been done with the mill levy that we have been paying to do what can be done locally has been all that's needed, because I really don't think it is. So it's extremely important that we do this. It has to move forward. There is. Uh, a continuing debate, of course, <coughs> among those who continue to sue, and with every delay that is incurred, it adds to the cost. Every objection from the state of Minnesota adds to the cost. Even though it may have been agreed before, it ends up having uh, resistance at some point down the line by another group. 
So anyway, I will continue to work hard to uh, pass that. I do not support Senate Bill 2238, and I would hope that we might be able to move forward and complete this project that we should have done already. Thank you. Representative Katie. Thank you. So with the diversion, I think whether, you know, whether the people out there who like it or don't like it, I think the decision's been made and, you know, we're going to, we're doing this diversion. And I think we need to move forward with it and, and get it done. You know, I think like Senator Lee said, every time there's a lawsuit and a delay, it's costing us money. I worked for a civil engineering firm in 2009 and, you know, at the time, some of the engineers said that it's going to take us 20 years at least, even if, you know, we're starting this now. And, and I think that's probably going to be true. It's taken a long time to get this done. And, you know, I think we, we don't need to uh, keep delaying it. And so with 2238, I guess I'm going to vote against that bill. I don't know if it'll even make it to the House. But, you know, I how we fund it and how we move forward, it's, you know, it's certainly complicated. But... Um, but I think we need to move forward. Thank you. Representative Koppelman. Thank you. I just read Senate Bill 2238. We're still in the phase of the session where each chamber is dealing with our own bills, so I had not looked at it yet it's being a Senate bill. But it appears to remove the uh, eminent domain authority from the state, which would be detrimental, I think, for projects like this. Um, I certainly support uh, flood control for Fargo, and the diversion obviously is what makes that happen. I think Representative Kading is spot on when he says that uh, this, you know, decisions have been made. Uh, we can't relive history. Historically, I would have liked uh, the diversion to be a mile west, so West Fargo could have expanded. Uh, I probably am not real comfortable with the backstop of property tax as a funding mechanism, although uh, everyone indicates that's not going to happen, and I, I hope and pray that they're correct about that. Uh, but those are really my only two objections to the idea. Goodness, if you live in West Fargo, you understand the importance of a flood diversion. Uh, we've had it on the Cheyenne River for many years, and we were probably the most flood-prone city in the state prior to that. So I'm not always a fan of taxes like many of my constituents are not, but those are the pe best tax dollars I've ever spent. So clearly we need to do this. Uh, the one issue that this bill does touch on that we do have some bills in the House uh, that also uh, deal with is the issue of eminent domain. And we've had a couple of those in the Judiciary Committee, and we really need to look at, again, a balance between the authority for eminent domain, which is seldom used but necessary for government uh, to be able to take property or, or have an easement on property, whatever is necessary to complete public projects, whether that's laying a power line or creating a street or, or building a diversion. Um, and so there are really two sides to the story. One is, that we're hearing about that has been allegedly abused really more in the western part of the state is a quick take authority, but we don't want to take it away either. We're looking at can we this be modified and safeguarded to protect taxpayers and property owners, but at the same time have the authority there for governing authorities. The other is this whole eminent domain structure where now uh, if a landowner's land is being threatened or taken uh, by eminent domain, the, the process is that the political subdivision, or in this case it could be the state, makes an offer. They say this is how much we, based on the market, based on when we've been able to tell how much we think that land is worth, uh, Mr. or Mrs. Landowner, you know, here's, here's our offer, will you sell it to us for that? They have the opportunity of doing that. They also have the opportunity of fighting it. And the way some of the structure is now, if they fight it, um, they, uh, the, the, the seizing entity, the, state, the governmental entity, ends up paying their legal bills, their appraisal fees, and everything else. We heard one story dealing with the Fargo diversion. Uh, in fact, Mr. McShane, who's a, normally our moderator and will be in the future, uh, was there testifying at length. And it was a diversion issue where they made an offer on some two pieces of vacant land, they were, they were lots, and, uh, and the city, uh, or the, uh, the landowners rather, said, no, that's not enough money, we want more. They went to court, risk-free, because the, the entity who's taking the property has to pay their legal bills too. There was a $38,000 appraisal fee from a Minnesota appraiser. We've got an appraiser on our committee, and he uh, took his breath away to hear that kind of an appraisal fee. And guess who had to pay for it? The diversion authority, the, the seizing entity, the taxpayers. In the end, after all the appraisals were done, the court was done with it, the property owners ended up getting less money than what was originally offered. So we need to bring some reasonability back to this, and that's a tangential issue, but it really is uh, something that's important as we look at all these things. Thank you. Since I don't see anyone else reaching for the button right now, one comment that I would make, too, is right now the, the governor has called for 
uh, putting up the additional $300 million over the, the next couple of biennials in order to help pay for uh, the additional costs. We all know that the delays have caused cost overruns. Just look at, and, and it's simple facts of one, you have to pay for the lawsuits and litigation. That hasn't been terrible. Um, but the longer you delay a project, the higher up construction costs. Look at the cost to build a road now versus 10 years ago. Look at the cost to build a house now versus 10 years ago. Costs don't go down uh, when you're dealing with these types of areas. And so as the longer we wait, the more the cost is going to go. And right now, you know, this is an expensive project, no doubt about it. And it's a vital project, and it's one that will help save resources within our area. I think in the city of Fargo alone, the impacted properties right now are would be looking at being assessed about $60 million a year worth of flood insurance costs uh, without a diversion, um, where you know once it's built, that money no longer leaves our economy, no longer leaves our metro area um, because of that. And so coming up with that additional money will help make sure that we can drive down the interest rate. It affirms the state's commitment to the cost of the project, and it'll ensure that we're able to get it done without seeing additional cost overruns down the line due to delays in financing or anything else, so that we lower the risk of having to backstop the project with property taxes uh, or increase sales taxes or anything else. So I think it's important that we stand firm and we get the commitment for the additional state resources. I know I've uh, met with the governor's office represented a few times, and I'll by Bachmeyer, the senior policy advisor is here right now, um, and he's been working diligently with, with the governor's office on all of the, the FM diversion issues, so thank you for what you've done, Levi. Um, and, and Commissioner Grinberg from the uh, city of Fargo is on the diversion authority, too. I know that he was just in D.C. working on this. we got a lot of players that are involved that are working on this project, and we need to make sure that we stand firm with a state commitment to additional dollars so we don't see those costs go up in the future. Thank you very much. Any last-minute questions? Uh Comments on that? Yeah. Um, District 22 residents tend to feel a little bit different than uh, I. There are a few that are in support, but um, <laughs> I understand. But there are uh, the city of Horace has come out against it. Um, kind of the western side of the the county has, and so I'm in a in a difficult spot because I do believe in flood protection. Um, we have redone the diversion around Castleton when I was a city auditor. And I have seen those costs because um, it was a three group entity um, of three entities that worked together to get the, the financing done, the project done, and then the, the taxing portion afterwards. And it, it is not, it was, it's not a fun project. It is a very emotional project. I have had um, people that my kids go to school with that their family farms are going to be gone when this happens. And, and they are 100 year old farmsteads that they, the pride that they talk about is very difficult. On the other hand, I understand what needs to happen. It, flood protection it is essential for our part of the, of the state. And so I just continue to listen to all sides of, of the project, all sides of, of everything, and continue to have those conversations <coughs> and the face-to-face -face conversations because um, it's quick and easy to shoot off a text message or an email and read it in somebody else's voice. But it is truly about um, looking forward towards the future and how we want our state to, to look um, with the importance of agriculture, with the importance of commerce, with getting our product in and out of, of the state, um, no matter if it's oil or egg products or anything else that we create from, from our great state. So if I can... Representative Koppelman, let's let's do this, and you'll have a, a chance. We're going to wrap things up with two minutes each, um, and we'll start with Representative Kading. But you can no as part of your two minutes for that. Thank you. I any I guess last, I, yeah. Any last thoughts? First off, I want to just thank everyone for being here and uh, participating in this event. I know sometimes. Um, it's difficult to get people involved, so I'm glad you're all here. Uh, I encourage you always to reach out to any and all of us on different issues because, you know, we do we do listen to our emails, we do listen to our calls, and it's important to uh, hear what people actually think about issues. So definitely encourage you to do that. Um, you know, the the rest of the session will move quickly along. I can't believe we're already already to day 25. Um, you know, whether we get out at day 70 or 75 or whatever it might be, I think we're we're trying to get done early this year to leave a, a couple days in place. And 
and it'll be an interesting second half of the session and, and I look forward to all the different conversations we're going to have. Thank you. I just uh, want to thank everyone for being here and anyone that's watching um, via the television. I have another one this afternoon in Castleton if you want to continue the conversations. Uh, yep, yep. Um, but I'm going to put a plug in for one of the bills I'm sponsoring. Um, it's 1122. It came out of appropriations with the due pass. But basically, our this has to do with a higher ed. Um, we have a North Dakota academic scholarship and a North Dakota career and technical technical education scholarship. Both are capped at $6,000. But what I would like to do is expand it down to our dual credit learners and offer that to help pay for those classes where they're getting high school credit and college credit, hopefully getting our kids on track, graduating in the four years, not the five, graduating in the two years, not the three, um, and, and, and having that accessibility. Right now, parents or students are actually paying 100% of those costs. Um, and their kids are not eligible for scholarships or um, financial aid until they reach that first year or that freshman year in college. So um, that's my plug. It's kind of a quiet little bill, but I think it'll definitely kind of gear, uh, change some of our education outlooks for everything. Um, I think with everybody up here, you know, we all, I just want to reiterate, we do all have very tough conversations amongst each other. We disagree and we agree on everything. But at the end of the day, we will work um, as hard as we can for the best of the state and the region and our prospective districts. Um, and I value every everyone's input and their background in history and stuff like that. And so when you come to us and we have these conversations, everybody has um, experience that's different. I was a foreign exchange student. I've lived on three different continents um, and I have traveled the world and so when I bring that experience back here I'm excited to share that and I'm excited to hear what um, people who grew up here, went to school here, live here um, within blocks of it. I mean it's just a, an incredible um, difference that we can bring together and, um, and make our state better. So thank you. Thank you. What I was going to say earlier, I was just going to comment on Representative Pyle's uh, uh, struggle with with on, her, on the diversion question. It reminded me of when Harry Truman once said that he, he said, "Give me a one-handed economist," and somebody said, "Well, what do you mean?" He said, "Well, they're always saying on one hand and on the other hand, and, and so that's kind of what we deal with in the legislature sometimes." But uh, it's great to be here. I appreciate all the questions. They've been very insightful and, and uh, very specific. And, and I know that there are some that weren't answered. So if you have the opportunity, uh, contact us. I know your legislators are always there uh, willing to hear from you. I, I always have to remind people of what a good system we have in North Dakota where we have a citizen legislature that only meets every other year. We're one of only four states that still does that. Uh, we, we have people who have other jobs, other businesses. This is a part-time effort. We... Uh, you send us to Bismarck, your neighbors, you elect neighbors from among you to go and serve you and represent you in Bismarck for a short time, and then we come back and live among you uh, under the laws we passed. And so that's really the best system I've seen uh, in state governments, and I've seen many of them around the country. Uh, as far as what we're busy with these days, uh, Representative Pyle, uh, Vice Chairs the uh, Political Subdivisions Committee, and she's spoken a lot to that. That's what we call my B Committee, which is a two-day committee, Friday, uh, Thursday and Friday it meets. Our, my committee that meets Monday through Wednesday is the Appropriations mm -hmm. Committee, which I chair. Uh, excuse me, the Judiciary Committee, which I chair, and it's been a busy, busy session. Uh, last session, I think we had 70, just over 70 bills, and I thought that was a lot of bills. This session, we had 105 assigned to us, and so it's been a busy time. Just a couple that I'll comment on real quickly because they may be things you're hearing about. Some of the things we've spoken of today already, like the eminent domain issue and so on. Uh, there's a bill out there, House Bill 1537. Another bill, House, House Bill 1453, which deal with similar issues. One is called uh, the Red Flag Bill, or some have called it the Gun Seizure Bill, depending on which side of the issue you're on. The other one deals with emergency uh, commitment for mental health cases. And uh, we're working those two bills together. I've assigned a uh, subcommittee to work on that. They're doing excellent work. I think we'll come up with something that, uh, that will work for the people of North Dakota. Secondly, uh, civil asset forfeiture is an issue we've dealt with in the legislature uh, for some time. And that has to do with where law enforcement seizes property and uh, can either sell it or keep it if people have committed a crime. No one really objects to that. What they do object to is that there are cases where they can do that where no crime has been committed or, or 
or at least has not been proven in a court. They haven't been convicted. And a lot of the law enforcement folks give us reasons why that still should happen. Others say it shouldn't because it's seizure of private property. We also have a subcommittee working on that. Got a report yesterday. They're doing excellent work as well. So that's just the tip of the iceberg. But uh, thank you all for being here. If you have questions, if you have concerns, please contact us. Tara Lee. Thank you to everybody who was involved in organizing this. It's always a pleasure to be here, and I look forward to visiting with uh, some of you for a bit afterwards if you have questions as well. A couple of things that I think you should be happy about. Uh, one is that we have, uh, two years ago, put in place a voucher system for uh, uh, individuals who are dealing with substance use disorders. And here's my little quickie example. If you lived in Valley City and you didn't have private insurance, if you wanted it provided through a regional uh, the human service center, you had to go to Jamestown or Fargo. Well, you maybe didn't, couldn't get away from work, you maybe didn't have enough money for gas, you maybe didn't have a good car, you maybe just didn't go. Now, the state provides vouchers so that the person can use those same dollars and go to a local provider of those services and remain in Valley City. It's worked so well in this two-year period, and it took a while to set it up. 1,800 people have already benefited from it. And those are the folks with substance use disorders who have benefited and where we have them on a road to recovery. Your support for those people is going to be a very important thing. The next uh, biennium that we're su supporting. But now we have a bill which will provide that same voucher service to individuals with mental illness, which is equally important. Those are the two things under the behavioral health umbrella that it would be substance use disorders and mental illness. So well, I think that's a very exciting thing. And the thing is that for the schools, they have services to their children. Many of those are billable to either Medicaid or private insurance. And so we want to make sure that the schools are not paying the cost of it, but it can be billed to uh, a carrier. And that is e most easily accomplished by contracts. So good things are happening. Uh, telehealth, license reciprocity, all kinds of things to try to make things move more smoothly. To Enhance the number of providers we have. Thank you. Senator Clemens. <laughs> I'm going to start off, um, well, first for thanking you for the uh, opportunity to be here. This is a great thing and an opportunity for people to um, listen to what's going on in Bismarck. Um, hopefully more people can hear and learn about this and uh, attend these meetings. I didn't get a chance because I used up too much time to mention Transportation Committee in my introduction, but I do serve on the Senate Transportation Committee. And I'm uh, just going to quickly run down a few things that I think would be of interest to you. Uh, the seatbelt law uh, was a very controversial bill, and it, it really showed sometimes how the process works in legislature. Um, a lot of people for or against that bill, but when it came time to vote, um, it was a tie, 23 to 23. One person was absent. He brought the bill back the next day, and it won 24 to 23. So it was, uh, and in the committee we were tied, so we couldn't even recommend do pass or not. But anyway, it was kind of interesting. Uh, some other things that have come out of the Transportation Committee are uh, a fee for electric cars. Um, there's only about 150 electric cars in North Dakota right now, but the, the concern was Yes, people are buying electric cars and they're conserving energy, but what about the road use? They're not paying a gas tax. And so there was a bill that was asking for $248 uh, extra fee on electric cars. We thought that was probably a little bit high. We brought it down to 110 and um, that went through the Senate. So we'll see if that uh, makes it. There was another move to raise the gas tax from 23 cents to 27 cents. Uh, we defeated that. Um, one uh, fee that is going to be going up if it goes through the House and is signed into law, uh, raising the license fee uh, on your driver's license. Uh, that hasn't been raised since 1987. The uh, Department of Transportation has been losing money on several programs that they uh, administer, and so. Um, Exam, it might go from $5 to $10, um, and I see my time is up, but uh, thank you again, and I'll be around talk to you afterwards. Representative Koppelman. Well, thank you. <clears throat> thank you all for being here. Um, I appreciate your questions. Uh, there wasn't that many that touched on the committees that I serve on, but I uh, tried to answer when I could. 
Um, on the tax committee, we've had an interesting um, session. We've had quite a few uh, proposals to uh, raise taxes, of which we've uh, um, defeated, I believe, all of those, um, or at least given them a do not pass recommendation to, for the full uh, body to consider. We have had uh, a proposal that uh, was a resolution that dealt with uh, whether or not the state should fully fund education and uh, not have the burden be on property tax for whatever a core equitable and adequate education looks like. So that was an interesting process. We've had um, several bills that talk about cutting the people's taxes. I know that uh, several of us have been um, have favored those. Um, and then we've also had in our Government Veterans Affairs Committee uh, um, several bills that, that are discussing veteran benefits and uh, there's going to be a study resolution um, introduced to consider studying that top to bottom to see if our um, modern generations are, are, they call them eras in, in, in that world, of veterans are, are pop properly represented and properly helped as we see those that have needs from the, the Gulf Wars and the uh, Afghanistan War. So um, in a nutshell, that's uh, what we've been working on. I uh, certainly welcome any uh, input that you all have for me and uh, look forward to um, uh, talking with you some more soon. Thank you. Representative Beadle. Well, as everyone else said, thank you very much for being here. Uh, if you have any questions that we didn't get to, feel free to grab any of us after this. We're all happy to chat. Uh, if you have any questions or you need to contact your legislators at any time, uh, legis.nd.gov has the full roster of the Legislative Assembly, both House and Senate, has all the bills, uh, all the information that you need to find us or find what's going on is all available there, including all of our revenue news and everything else. I think it's important for everyone to remember that hey, we're still very early in the process for this legislative session. So if something's not going your way or you want to weigh in on something, do so now. It gives us plenty of time to be able to make adjustments, make changes, make amendments, um, influence the process, and, and set things right. We're pretty committed and focused this legislative session to, one, ensuring that our infrastructure across the state is still taking that's kind of the onus for behind the Prairie Dog Bill, getting some of those resources out there. Um, we're going to see it in the $1.5 billion DOT budget that we have coming out of the House here soon, too. Um, there's a lot of revenue going and flowing towards making sure that our infrastructure is, is in place. And in addition to that, this time, we're also looking at our, our state's infrastructure from an uh, inter, uh, IT perspective. Um, right now, the state of North Dakota has 5.3 million attacks per month uh, onto our system. And if that doesn't, if, if you say, okay, well, that's the state's problem, um, all of your tax data and everything else is at the uh, state tax department's office and everywhere else. So we're trying to make sure to keep that safe. We have to make sure we're investing in that and also helping to enable some of our UAS industries, autonomous industries, everything else across the state, looking at the tech infrastructure we need there, state radio so that uh, all of our local uh, peace officers are able to have uh, to interoperability and talking to people all up and down the state if they have to respond to another DAPL type situation so they can talk to each other. We need to make our investments as a state in to that infrastructure in addition to just roadways. Uh, we're going to make sure that we continue to invest in education, invest in our people, and then also workforce. So we have a lot of proposals out there to help expand the workforce and grow that, that area of the state's uh, economy uh, and meet the needs that we have all up and down the state, whether it's streamlining military spouses to be able to get licensing so they can come in, expanding reciprocity access, or lowering some of the barriers of entry to some, certain professions while still maintaining quality of care. Uh, there's a lot that we're working on. Um, and, and the business is far from done. Uh, on a personal note, thanks everyone for who has reached out to me to weigh in on any bills, um, for, for any of the input you've been able to provide and to help us as we move through the process, uh, and also the people that are that are here that are still helping with, uh, you know, my my wife and everything else that's that's here in town. I, uh, special thanks to my neighbor Jared who plowed out my driveway and everything with <laughs> my wife, so I didn't have to do that when I came home, and it helped her be able to leave the house yesterday. So uh, thanks everyone for all the support that you always give us. It is greatly appreciated. Thank you all. Um, I'm going to make a mental note, and if I can, Bernie, I'll give this to you. Um, and these are the questions that did not get addressed, and we'll give those to Chris McShane for the next uh, session. I want to thank all the legislators. Um, on a, a small note, I've had an opportunity to serve on six county, um, excuse me, six commissions and councils in my years. It's not an easy job. I can't even imagine what it's like for folks like you when you get to the next level, but uh, thank you for your service uh, to our community and thank you to the chamber and others. And so uh, I'll turn it over to the mayor. Before you do that, Rich, yes. 
we uh, we understand that today is a special day. Oh yes, that's it's right. Dardis's birthday. Uh, so uh, that's that's right. Right. Thank join you. us. Thank you. Happy yeah. birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Bernie. Happy birthday. That's a mark against uh, Representative Collins. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I too would like to thank all you legislators. Uh, this week, the three days that I was in Bismarck, I had extended conversations with Representative Koppelman, Representative Koppelman, Senator Lee. Uh, I'll be back next week. Representative Katie, I'd like to visit with you a little bit. Uh, but thank you. You know, uh, as my new role for the first time at my age, uh, I can appreciate the differences of opinion, the passions of people, your passions, don't always mesh. And so, but nonetheless, the service that you provide, the hours that you put in, and uh, at times the discussions that you have to endure, thank you so very much. It's, uh, it's a great service to our community and to our state. So we're thankful. Uh, I neglected to do something earlier. Amanda needs to stand up. This is the young lady from the chamber that does all of our coordination. Katie, excuse me, Katie's here. I, I work with Katie and Amanda. My apologies, Katie. But if you'd stand up, please. And also, <laughs> Katie's worked with public policy for the chamber. She was also on the task force with regard to the governance and Jeff Wolf sitting right there from More Engineering. Both of these two folks were on the governance committee with regarding once one board, two boards, three boards. So, if the discussion and uh, your questions are there, they'd be two great people to talk to about that. Also, we have a favorite son in the room, the senior public policy advisor for Governor Bergen, Levi Bachmeyer, a West Fargo student and uh, a new homeowner in West Fargo, also. And he and Rachel are going to make their home here, so it's great to have the governor. The senior <laughs> policy uh, of course, one of uh, West Fargo's favorite son. So great to have you here today, Levi. Levi, uh, also uh, in addition to uh, Commissioner Grinberg being uh, the finance chairman for the Diversion Authority, we also have Mike Thorsted who represents West Fargo. So Mike, you've done a great job there. Thank you for that. And Mike is also the deputy mayor of the city of West Fargo. Uh, thank you again to the school district. Mark, Beth, thank you so very much. Denise, you're here. Uh, Board member uh, Jim Jonas is here. I have a tendency to want to call him coach every time I look at him, but uh, thank you all for being here representing the school district and your engagement. Craig, again, you're a bit wounded. Laurie's probably been pretty tough on you again, so God knows that's deserved, so uh, <laughs> we're glad to have you with us, even with a bad wing. So thank you for being here. And to my fellow uh, folks at West Fargo, again, Mr. Turnovic, Mr. Thorsted. Uh, Melissa Richard, uh, I think, who's probably stepped out, who does most of our co coordinating as our communications director. She does a beautiful job in the city. And, uh, and I'd also like to acknowledge our chief, Yankees here, Deputy Chief Boyer is here. Both these gentlemen serve our community very proud, and we're happy that you're with us today. <laughs> one last thank you for a, uh, a, a rookie at your age for doing this. <laughs> To my friend, a longtime friend, Rich Lego, you did a beautiful job, thank Rich. You. Thank you for. So again, thank you all for being here on behalf of the city of West Fargo, the chamber, and the West Fargo School District. All these wonderful people up here that serve our community. Thank you so much for joining us today. Have a good day.